Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Once again, as always, I so appreciate you tuning in and checking out what's on the uh, agenda for the day or week, whatever. With me is John Denbor, who is going to talk about a variety of things, starting with an exercise program that he has created called the SMART. It's an acronym program that should help reduce dementia. He's got a book and a Netflix uh, documentary, and I don't know. What else you got going for us, John? Yeah, I think that's the, those are the two main things. Uh, I'm really interested in the topic of helping uh, identify dementia early and helping to mitigate uh, the intensity of the disease. Well, we caregivers appreciate that, especially it seems that the stress and the physical exertion of caregiving definitely puts us at a higher risk. So we all need to do what we can to mitigate those risks. So why don't you give us your background and then we can launch into whichever section you want to jump into. Yeah. So, uh, I have, uh, I guess, interesting to me, uh, back. I have a, uh, so I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training, although I'm not in practice um, right now. Um, and so my specialty area is in the area of geriatric neuropsychology. And so what I really focus on is, um, the, as older people, helping people age um, better and helping people um, identify uh, dementia processes as early as possible and to lessen the extent of it um, prior to its um, onset. And then once people have it, um, lessening the severity of it. And so uh, that's been my main thrust of my professional career. I did my training at um, in Colorado, Montana, um, Harvard University, and then Barrow Neurological Institute for my postdoc. And so I've been in practice now for about 15 years. Um, I haven't practiced for the last three years and for the last seven or eight years have been really focused on um, uh, running a company uh, that's been uh, really at the forefront of helping identify and mitigate, mitigating our early stage dementia. That's fantastic. There seems to be a lot more people like you with medical degrees or PhDs like neuropsychology who are going outside the medical field, but still working on their same goal, like reducing dementia. Um, I'm, I'm finding that fascinating because I, my listeners know I, I don't have a particular fondness for our medical industry. I, I got run through the ringer with my mom. And thankfully, I am 55, you know, 55 and a half getting there <laughs> and um, healthy. So I don't have to deal with doctors very often. So <laughs> I don't I don't have uh, too many one on one dealings with the medical profession right now. And I plan on keeping it that way. Right. My paternal grandmother lived to 103 with very few problems, mostly glaucoma. And that's my goal. Skip the glaucoma, live to 103. Yeah, yeah. I'm fortunate to have pretty good genes in my family as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I can't speak for others, but I would say that, you know, it's uh, like any professional structure. Uh, the medical community is, for those of us that probably want to address larger public health issues, um, you know, being a clinician on a daily basis is, is super admirable and it's tough work and it's uh, well needed work, but it's probably limiting in that respect. So for me, it's much more important. I, you know, I love seeing clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but the, one of the main reasons I stopped practicing was because I wanted to, it was more important for me to address the general issue of dementia from a public health uh, standpoint as opposed to, um, you know, addressing it on a case by case basis, which, you know, again, is much, much needed, but, uh, I, in my opinion, at least doesn't fit my skill set or personality. And, uh, perhaps, um, you know, I'm a, I guess perhaps more of a risk taker and an innovator. And I'm not saying that's better or worse. It's just getting to know yourself and where you, uh, where you feel like you'd be happiest functioning. Makes sense. And that's important for brain health too, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, doing something that you really love on a day to day basis. I think some people are it's it, it again, it's not mutually exclusive, but some people are more strategy oriented and more global picture oriented and some people are more execution oriented. Um, and I'm probably fall much more in line with the strategy kind of larger picture, um, orientation. And, uh, you know, the combination of the two is, um, in the intersection of the two is the thing that's perhaps the most valuable, but, um, yeah, you know, I would say this, you know, in my personal opinion and professional opinion, you know, this is something that this is a disease that we uh, have gotten incredibly wrong and backwards. And, you know, we've really done a, uh, really done a, a, you know, honestly, a major disservice to the general public and, you know, caregivers for individuals with dementia. I, you know, that being said, you know, I sort of hesitate to say that because I don't, you know, my opinion, it's not effort related. I think in most people, most practitioners, and obviously most caregivers, uh, you know, the overall majority are giving more than their best effort. Um, you know, they're giving an extra effort and it's overwhelming, but I think as you identified it, it's the transition of information from the, you know, what we have been trained to know, and then how we impart that information in an accessible manner, but also casting a wide net to people in the general public. Um, And that's the main impetus for why I chose to go this route in my career is um, I was just got so fed up on seeing, you know, 10 to 12 clients a day and telling them the same thing. And then having each one, you know, hundreds and thousands, you know, in a year, all be surprised. Well, I didn't know that, or we were never told that, or, you know, stuff that was so um, basic, you know, it's sort of, I use this, you know, these examples, but it's like, if you would go in and you had, you know, lung cancer, it'd be like, some of this stuff is like saying, you know, hey, you probably shouldn't smoke. Like that causes cancer. You know, people, yeah, that is kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, would be like, yes, of course, right? But I feel like we're that far behind in this area. Is that, you know, you know, um, there's not a lot of, I guess, so-called experts in this area, and the ones that are, are, I think, typically pigeonholed and so stacked up in their own practices that they're not going out and. Um, making um, larger public health statements in regards to this issue. It's definitely a very challenging disease to tackle. (laughs) Yes. So we need everybody putting in all efforts, which don't always align together easily, but that's life. It's not just dementia or caregiving. I'm finding that on the technology end of this podcast. It's like, come on, people, just do what you're supposed to do, and it'll all work out. So far. That's, that message isn't getting across lately, but you earlier made a comment about identifying like the early triggers of the disease. I think that was the word you used. What, what the, I'm because my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia. My mom had Alzheimer's. I am quite familiar in hindsight, what, um, what signs like, oh yeah, you know, her forgetting to put due dates on orders for clients, that was a sign. It was very easy to dismiss as the phone rang, the door rang, she needed to use the bathroom, she got distracted. I mean, these things, we all make these kind of blunders in our careers. You know, you don't don't do something when you need to do it because logical reason. But when you look back, you realize it happened more and more frequently. It happened closer to her day off. It happened when she was more tired. You know, just like, oh, duh. So what kind of things do you think in your your opinion your trained opinion are triggers or things we need to be aware of in maybe our 40s and 50s or even earlier if if that's your opinion that we should be paying attention to that we shouldn't easily dismiss yeah so i'm going to um if you don't mind i'm going to answer your question but i'm going to make a statement prior okay like um let me throw the analogy of uh breast cancer um, and I, it may, you know, if you're a male, it could be prostate cancer. Let's just say, just to think of an example, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not a gr- it's not an altogether perfect analogy, but it's very similar in the sense that we don't depend on patients or their loved ones or the people around them, or even their doctors necessarily to detect this at the very, very early stages. Instead, what we do is we, we say very clearly 
and almost everybody knows it that hasn't been living under a rock. You know, when you reach a certain age, you have to get a mammogram. Um, and it's earlier if um, you have a family history of breast cancer. And, you know, my father had prostate cancer. So when I reached the age of 35, 10 years ago, I started getting my prostate checked. And I did that because I knew of it. Like, I, 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 if my doctor didn't say it, which I can't even remember if he or she did or didn't, but I, I knew of it. My dad, my dad, uh, without any medical training, had known of it so much so that he told me and my brother about it. So there was enough public health awareness to say, we essentially, we can't depend on ourselves to make these super microscopic observations if there even is anything to observe. So I guess before I answer your question, I would say that we already got ourselves sort of bass backwards in terms of thinking about this disease in the sense that we're not doing preventative maintenance and preventative evaluation. So what I've been, my sort of, I guess it's considered radical, but my sort of uh, thing has always been when you get on, when you get to be 55 and 60, but certainly when you got, when I get on Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans to 65 and you get your wellness check, that there should be a series of cognitive evaluations that start occurring at that time that are not mandatory, but that are structured and regulated and that you know about to make sure that your cognitive health is monitored. So if there's any really, really even extremely subtle signs, then you can be sort of funneled into a um, like, hey, let's observe this a bit more and watch to see if this is developing because we do have a lot of good normative data that shows that we can start predicting it seven to 10 years prior to its onset with uh, neuropsychological evaluation. We know that imaging does not detect it until it's started. Um, oh, it's too and what, late. Yeah, exactly right. You said it beautifully. That's exactly what I was going to say. And then at that point, it's too late. So for me, it's like we put it, we just constantly put ourselves in a losing situation. We put our caregivers, our loved ones, our doctors in a losing situation because we're we're essentially just being entirely reactive to this disease. Whereas I think I don't think there's one solution, but like if you look at safe sex practices or you look at smoking cessation or alcohol cessation or all these things, these major things that we've undertook in as a society, and dementia is is by far a greater disease in terms of numbers, incidence, and prevalence than anything I just mentioned. Um, you know, all these things have public health campaigns. We see them on billboards or we see them on commercials or whatever. And so the, the, I would, I would say more important, but the biggest piece of it is getting, making sure we get this, in my opinion, a very large public health campaign that's focused on saying one, Dementia is, is not just something that happens when you get old. It's not just in like a co-occurrence or a symptom of old aging. Um, it's a separate disease that's a disease like any other disease like cancer. We wouldn't say cancer is something that you just happens when you get old, right? That's true. Um, yeah, you know, and number two, um, you know, we then start um, developing systems in healthcare that help not force, but encourage people to get uh, these cognitive checks when they're, um, when, they, when they're 55, 60, 65, things that are covered under Medicare that are already covered, things that are covered under Medicare Advantage of no cost to them might take 15 or 20 minutes and as part of your daily, um, or not daily, but your uh, you know, every six month evaluation. And if you just do that, I mean, I'm not saying just because that's not an easy thing to do. But it's not a hard thing to do from a public health care perspective. And if we did that, that would be huge in helping identify early, mitigate risk, um, get caregivers in good positions, et cetera. So before all that is to say, um, when we start trying to identify early, early onset of symptoms, at the time that we identify them, even you know the most astute among us, the disease has already been at work for at least three to five years. And at yep. that point, it's accelerated to the point where it's crested that top of that roller coaster and it's, it's on its sort of way down and it's accelerating. And I think, you know, then we're, then we're talking about things like um, reactive caregiving, which is, as you know, and your listeners know, incredibly essential, but incredibly hard. And, um, 
you know, like for me, again, I, I, I totally admit that I'm on the, the very considered sort of the very extreme of this, but we, you know, people care give for people with cancer, but it's not looked at as analogous to caregiving with dementia. Caregiving with dementia is sort of looked at as it's just going to, if, if, you know, your parents or you develop dementia, it's going to be assumed that sort of like, Hey, this is just, it was something that was sort of inevitable. It happened. And now we have a caregiving position. Whereas, you know, if someone develops cancer, there's always this messaging and language around fighting it. We're going to fight it. We're going to battle. We're going to win the battle with cancer. And I don't, it's, that's not that kind of language or thought process with dementia. And I, and I guess I would attest that it's a separate, but very analogous uh, disease. And I would also attest that our language surrounding it um, really influences our thoughts and our reaction to it. I believe it. I believe because my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. She passed away at the very start of the pandemic, March of 2020, which was a blessing for all of us. They, we didn't talk about it. You know, the generation before me, I'm, a, I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I, I have frequently remind people of that, are appalled that the millennials share everything about caregiving on social media, you know, their loved ones, the struggles, the joys, everything. And I'm what I see being in the middle as a Gen Xer is the stigma is coming off the, you know, people are more willing to discuss it. It's, you know, back in the early days of, I guess, cancer, we haven't dealt with that too much in my family. People didn't want to talk about the big C, you know, it was, it was kind of shameful and now it's not. I mean, I don't know how we go from feeling like getting some sort of disease is shameful, like cancer or HIV or dementia it, to shifting it to not being shameful or a stigma. I kind of feel like we're shifting that way. Do you, do you see that as well? I'd like to think so. Uh, I'd like to think that. We are, I think we're decent. I think slowly, uh, you know, I, and I'm a gen, I'm a gen Xer as well. I think our generation and then the generation after us has begun destigmatizing mental health issues. I think those in general have become a bit more destigmatized. I think the, I, I, in my opinion, I think people want to do the same with dementia, but we still know so little or more accurately, uh, medical profession somehow has not transferred this basic knowledge, very basic knowledge to the general public. And uh, I think you now that's more the medical profession's fault than anything else. And we need to figure out how to get that information out to people because people, as you know, right, you, you very accurately identified the distinction between Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia. But you're very much in the minority among that. And to me, that's such a, um, that's like saying depression or anxiety. It's a very basic thing. It's basic 101, you know, dementia. People, you know, I do talks all over the world and uh, people come to the talks and they're obviously very interested and they're very impacted by the disease. So they're among the minority of people that are really wanting to know more. And the number one question I get all the time still is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And that's like saying, you know, what is the difference between brain cancer and, you know, and leukemia? Um, it's just a very basic one-on-one question. And that goes at the limited amount of information that is out there that people have access to that we spend time um, imparting to the general public. And I, so I, I guess to answer your question, I think, I'd like to think that people are really interested and motivated to change the perception, but they do what I'm just envisioning or assuming you and your listeners do, which is go out on their own and find out on their own and research stuff on their own. Mm -hmm. And what disease, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of like really getting off on a soapbox here, but what, <laughs> disease, like what disease does that? 
You know, like really, what does what other disease can we think of that's on a pandemic level worldwide scale that robs us of who we are before we physically die and could be in a lot of you know, psychological, emotional, physical ways, one of the worst diseases to ever exist. And certainly from a numbers perspective, the one of the worst diseases ever to exist. What other disease that's even close to that do we have such little information about that we're just that sending is- our public out to research everything on their own? And then they, they have these awesome groups like yours where people come together and do it on their own. That's like me trying to build my house on my own. It's, you know, I could, I could, I can do it and I can do it well, but I shouldn't have to. Yeah, that is true. It is very frustrating to me. I was uh, completely unaware of 99% of the resources for the first 17 years. My mom had the disease mostly because my dad did most of the caregiving, but once he passed away and I started looking around, there's tons of resources, but there's scattered like seeds in the wind. And that, that drives me bananas. I do see that slowly shifting, but dear God, please, please speed that up. Cause you know, I'm not getting younger and you know, I do everything I can do to prevent the disease, which is the other part of our topic today, but God forbid, you know, I would like this problem to be a whole lot less horrific for everybody. If I get the disease, because like you said, we shouldn't have to go out and research on our own and find this this helpful thing here and that helpful thing. It's like it's a nightmare. Is do you think the medical profession doesn't provide this information because and this is gonna sound negative and I'm not trying to be negative, but there is no they don't know what causes it. There is no cure. It's like, we don't know what to do for you. Good luck. There's the door. That is how I felt with my mom's general physician. It was like, why are you here? I can't fix her. It's very frustrating. Honestly, I think that's the most honest way of putting it. Um, I I mean, from a general physician standpoint, like, um, you know, not as an excuse or just an explanation, but general physicians aren't trained on this. Like I, Mm -mm. I talked to tons of general physicians in like only small, only relatively few hospital systems that are more considered cutting edge and innovative will get me to come in and speak to like general physician residents or even their general physicians, their general physician attendings. They don't know this and I'm not faulting them. It's just, they don't have this knowledge. And, um, there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, and you know, part of it's, I think more psychological is that, you know, it, uh, you know, 50 years ago, we considered, we called Alzheimer's old timers. And mm-hmm. it was a, it was a very much a stigmatized, you know, you people are going crazy. And we, you know, we actually honestly sort of laughed at it as like, that's just grandma or grandpa going nuts, not so. And, um, and we sort of accepted it as just an inevitability about growing old. So, um, you know, I think that that's honestly what, unless you go to a real specialty area, and then people are really shocked at, wow, there's all these things that we can do to identify it early. There's these things that we can do to help mitigate it. There's these things that we can do that are scientifically reputable. But we're still very much in the very early ages of this where our elderly are falling prey and our caregivers are falling prey to scams. Um, you know, everybody understandably is looking for a cure and not really understanding you know, biologically, there, there's just not, there's not one on the horizon. And then I think, again, this is going to sound negative, but, and there's nobody that's there. I'm, I'm not against, you know, drug companies necessarily by nature, but um, there's a lot of overselling of what, um, you know, so-called, you know, anti-dementia drugs that are out there can do. And I think um, there's nothing wrong with them per se, but I think in everybody's hopes over the last 10 to 20 years that something will happen. Um, I, well, this is, I don't know, this is really going to get me in trouble, but you know, I think, <laughs> I think I owe you, I think I owe you my directness. I think people have with some become so zealously preoccupied with the cure that they then have um, forsaken the things that we must do on a simple daily basis that are not aligned with any 
drug company or any product or any company or any anything you buy, the simple things that people can do to help mitigate it. So for me, when I do big talks or I do talks at all, I really start out with making it very clear, in my opinion, um, it is foolhardy to wait um, for a cure in bank and a cure because um, everything that we've done to this point has been a failure. And it doesn't mean there's not going to be one someday. It's just that, um, you know, like we know what causes heart attacks. There might be in, in, you know, in the future, there might be a miraculous pill that one can take to, to significantly limit their propensity of heart attacks. But that being said, nobody's waiting around for that pill. People are going out and walking and doing diet stuff and other things. So with, if you are at risk for dementia, or even if you're not, don't bank on science to save you. Um, go out and, you know, aerobic exercise. Um, 30 minutes a day is the best thing you can do. You know, heart healthy diet. We all know these things. Um, and then the big thing that we did as a company um, and that we're still doing is engaging in new and novel learning. So, you know, people have been told to um, work with their brain and there's been a lot of gimmicky like brain training type of devices, but really, um, you don't need to buy anything. Um, I, you, you know, if you go out and you learn something truly new, truly authentically new. Now you got to challenge yourself because very few things are new to us. Most of the That's time true. we have experience with things and we tend to gravitate to the things we know. So when I tell our client, my clients, Hey, you need to do things that are new. And they say, Oh yeah, I've been trying to, you know, I've been really interested in reading that book on civil war history. And I'm like, well, are you, you know, do you, are you into civil? Yes. I really like civil war history. Well, that's not new to you. Um, what's new to you is learning Italian or learning, <laughs> you know, learning Japanese. And this. well, that's, that's a lot. Well, that's what your brain requires to form new neurons and help release chemicals in the brain to help prevent the, um, the, the, um, the shrinkage of the, um, of the cortex that occurs in all forms of dementia. And so, you know, three things, heart, healthy diet. We know that aerobic exercise is by far the biggest thing. Heart health equals brain health. So 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise, cardiovascular. And then the last thing that people probably aren't doing is truly new and novel, rigorous learning. It need not be uh, drudgery. It need not be like studying for tests. It just is learning a new thing and learning a new thing and really being, um, you know, doing that for an hour to an hour and a half a week. And if you start doing that when you reach the age of 50, um, and then you can mitigate the chances of um, onset, push back the onset by, you know, as much as seven to eight years, and then reduce the intensity of the disease by 35 to 40%. Um, but you know, that's really, actually a lot. Yes, it's a ton. And then to really underscore the, the issue is that, um, we don't have anything right now. There's nothing that exists FDA approved or otherwise that were, uh, stop or reverse or erase dementia. And once you start it, it is truly an exponential compounding equation that compounds against you. So from year one, to year two, people usually don't see the onset. It's usually silent. People don't see the behavior change. It's very, 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 very subtle, if at all noticeable to anybody. It doesn't show up on our MRI. So it's essentially non-detectable. And then from years two to three, it will get 10 times worse. And it will probably also be non-detectable. Only start being detectable very, very subtly by people that are sort of trained to see it in years three to four. And by that time, it's gotten 20 times as worse. So for me, I don't at all say that efforts at intervention are futile, but uh, they have very low impact in comparison to prevention, preventative early type of um, measures. I was at a talk in, it was either 2017 or 2018 on basically it's kind of, Pre pre COVID pandemic on the the tsunami of Alzheimer's and dementia, people living with that disease those diseases that's coming, and this person was talking about the financial costs to the global community and 
if we could, and I'm terrible with numbers, something I guess I should work on. <laughs> if we prevent the onset of dementia by five years, it lessened the economic impact globally. It lessened the number of people that develop the full full-fledged disease. If we put, you know, if we postpone the onset of the disease by 10 years, you know, it was trillions of dollars of savings and hundreds of thousands of people that don't get the disease, you know, and it's, it's almost, it's kind of like a morbid race. It's like, okay, like I didn't mention to you that my maternal great grandmother also had senile dementia as they called it back in the day before I was born. So this family history is not great. And I'm aware of that. That is why I exercise daily. You know, I have a Peloton. I have two golden retrievers. So I get double the opportunity to work my, you know, heart, my heart health. And, you know, I've learned a new career. I have learned some technology this year of 2022 because it's hating me. So I've had to learn things that not, not in my wheelhouse normally. All knowing that, okay, well, if I want to live to be 100, I got to push out the onset of the potent, the possible onset of this disease at 25 years, man, 30 years is a long time. So that's another thing people should consider is, you know, like my mom started showing signs at huh, 53, not fun, but in normal, not early onset Alzheimer's, people start showing signs in their eighties. If you don't st start, don't start showing signs. That's easy for me to say until you're in your 90s, you may very likely pass away before the truly horrific stages of the disease take hold of you. And I think that's worth working towards personally. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I think that's super, super well said. Like that's, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. Like that was, that's extremely well said. And, you know, for me, what you mentioned about is so-called silver tsunami, um, you know, from a pure numbers perspective, this is um, the number one health concern, certainly, but arguably the number one concern of any societal problem worldwide, um, because you have this generation across a lot of countries that is be, has was their largest generation population wise by far before or after. So in America, we have the baby boomers that are now at the beginning stages of a dementia process that the generation three times as big as any generation before or after it. And then you have, you know, if you look at America, we're a relatively small country in comparison to countries like China. So um, when I, um, when I consulted, you know, in China, you know, the numbers are incredibly staggering. They're the first couple of times I went there, they're, they're almost unfathomable. You, there's five cities in China that are over 20 million people. With dementia? Um, no, over 20 oh. million people, general population wise. But if you look, <laughs> if you look at the, um, you know, the, the numbers, you know, in America, we're talking about millions of people, um, which is a ton, but in China and in India, 
they're talking about hundreds of millions of people with dementia. And so if you think about the global economy, if you think about uh, increasing life expectancy and longevity of life in in combination with that, we're dealing with a reckoning here. That's been, that probably has been as big as my other message of getting out there and saying, Hey, like we can't get behind the eight ball. We're already behind the eight ball in this. (laughs) There, I think the eight ball ran over us. Yeah. So when you talk about increasing life expectancy, you know, I hate, again, I hate to sound morbid here, but you're going to have a lot of people living longer, but uh, that are cognitively declining. And then what is that going to mean for where we house these folks? What is that going to mean for the kind of care that we receive? Um, Medicare, you know, imagine Medicare spending 20 times the resources that it already does in five to 10 years. Um, you know, our tax base, et cetera. I'm not an economist, but you can sort of imagine this. Oh, yes. Um, For me, I always, I'm not trying to sound political, but I always, I don't put my trust in systems. I just, I think we have great systems. We have great healthcare in America, but we have become overly trusting and dependent upon um, our doctors. And at this point, I think you're right. As you said it, they can't really do much right now it's up to it's up to the majority of people as individuals to take you know these things on as impetus in their personal life um because the 99 percent of the medical community is lost in regards to this i my my honest belief and i really hope it doesn't come down to this or at least i'm gone if if and when it does is until the greater population of our country the globe where however broadly you want to look at it until people realize how devastating this disease is going to be on the global economy, but let's just talk about America. I do have listeners worldwide, but you know, when you have people that have to retire early, when you've got millennials that leave the workforce to take care of a parent or a grandparent, you know, and they're trying to get back in the workforce in their 40s, I th- I think there's going to be a super ugly reckoning and I really hope I'm not around to see it cuz I really don't want to see that. And that's That's a really ugly thought process because I am an advocate, legislative advocate with the Alzheimer's Association. So I'm aware of the billions of dollars of free care that people like myself provide and have provided for our loved ones. And we do it because we love them and because it's important and it's necessary. But there's no way in heck anybody else is going to take on that bill. Like, why would you take on that bill? Medicare can't take on that bill not without bankrupting it. And then we're all in trouble. So yeah, it's, we got a, we got a big reckoning coming. And I hope, like you said, we need to take it upon ourselves to be as healthy as possible and not expect to go to the doctor and be cured with a pill. Like nobody wants to go to the doctor and hear, well, you need to lose weight and you need to move your body and you need to sleep better and you need to reduce your stress. And like, no, we don't want to do all that. Could you just give me a pill? I'm not of that belief. I never have been, but that's, you know, we feel crappy. We go to the doctor, we want to go leave and we want to feel better in a day or two. We don't want to continue feeling crappy. (laughs) So it's not just the medical profession that, you know, we got blamed to go around. So I'm not pointing fingers in any one particular direction. We just, we definitely need a reset on thinking on aging you know, I'd rather if I don't make it to 103 with my mind intact and that's only 83, that's fine. I don't want to live an extra 20 years not knowing what's going on. You know, we need to we need to determine how we can make our own quality of life because it's going to look that's, different for everybody. I'm going to say, I think that's a super, super powerful statement is to is to think about think about it in those terms and, you know, think about it from a general I think, you know, you having the legislative experience can kind of see within that. But, um, you know, yeah, I think we're going to be extremely limited in our resources going forward. Which is unfortunate, but, you know, maybe our smaller generation will give it a little breathing room. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think care, you know, you you know, your show is about caregiving. And I think this is obviously extremely important to caregivers. But as I'm sure you've said on your show many times, you know, caregivers are at much more significant risk for the development of the disease because of a lot of different factors, but include, you know, generally encompassed under the umbrella of stress. And so it's really, I always found that to be, and I still find that to be very 
saddening. So I think I would just really hope that your your listeners, for my opinion, don't feel like they need to be the spearhead of this, that they, you know, continuing to give themselves permission to step aside and say, you know, I, I am doing the absolute best I can, but I need to prioritize myself in this situation because, um, you know, I have my health and I want to try to protect it as much as I can. And I hope that message is getting through to the caregivers when caregivers are um, interacting with medical personnel. But if it is not, I'd, I'd certainly like to, to say it clearly. I repeat that regularly. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with this statistic that 65% of caregivers end up hospitalized or die before the yeah. person they're caring for. And, yes. you know, because like I said, I'm not super great with numbers unless it's dollar signs with plus signs in front of them. Yeah. I assumed that that number was going down because more more millennials are becoming caregivers. More millennials, obviously younger than me. I assumed that, you know, maybe that's that percentage was decreasing. It is not. Millennials are dying from heart attacks and strokes because of the stress of caregiving. That freaks right. me out. Like, Hello. This is a problem, people. So we need one. We need to understand that it's very important. And I, re I repeat this all the time. You cannot put your own life on hold, your own dreams on hold. Yes, it might take longer. and That's OK. You know, if you're you're going to college to get a degree, if it takes eight years instead of four, you still did it. You never know. It's like I, I have had some challenges this year, 2022, and I keep putting this self-imposed deadline on myself. It's like, I got to get this certain specific thing started by May. Well, okay, no, now June. Well, okay, no, now July. Once I realized this is stupid, I'm like stressing myself out. When, it's, when, it, when it happens, it will happen. And as soon as I released that stress, the idea popped into my head and it was like, well, duh. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just, you have, you know, and it's like, and as selfish as it sounds, you know, our lives still matter too. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm giving up or, or that I did give up on my mom or I didn't love my mom or anything along those lines. It just meant that, you know, it's like, what do we need a flag that says caregivers lives matter too? Like it does. Yeah. And I don't, I'm having a conversation soon with a, a gal, another podcaster that we're going to talk about how to actually help caregivers re reorient their thinking yeah, so that they can help prioritize themselves because it's amazing how you you lovingly go into okay i'll make some adjustments and take care of mom you know stop by and make sure mom's taking her meds and then next thing you know you're up to your eyebrows and in, in you know feces and urine and screaming matches and you know you can't work anymore and you're like what the heck happened to my life we we yeah. have to not do that and it's not easy just i mean oh, it's God. easy to yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I myself, um, you know, that I've studied this and sort of considered an expert in this niche, you know, I, um, my grandmother, it's in, you know, in, in my movie, in my book, my grandmother, uh, who helped raise me, you know, um, succumbed to dementia, uh, at, in her later eighties, early nineties. And we were, it was sort of similar trajectory to that. And I was, you know, I should, I should have been, you know very aware of what was happening and i was aware but yes i mean you're there's no system in place for you to do anything but that um really um and so um you know that's a big piece one I, as we were talking i just remembered one thing i'd like to say you know um most you know 99.9 percent .9 of caregivers are burnt out and they're going to a, the doctor with a real hope and they should have it or a hope of an answer. And I think you identified something really, really um, insightful in your statement at the beginning of our talk, which was, um, you know, the doctor is typically trying to provide an answer that they don't have, yeah. you know, and I think it's okay to not lower your expectations of the quality of Medicare, medical care, but I think people should have a more realistic expectation of um, there's no, going to be no magic bullet. There's, they may not even, you probably will know more than them. Um, and that's okay too. Um, and it's disheartening, but I think that's actually more the reality. Um, and, and I think 
I would speak for myself, um, you know, when I was really in full-time clinical practice, you know, you're seeing a ton of patients a day and it's certainly not an excuse, but I would not be afraid as nice as you all are of being really direct and having to repeat yourself more than what you think you need to repeat because sometimes you're hearing it, but not hearing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, like I, you know, well, I got to know my patients and my caregivers really well. So then, you know, they felt that they could be very direct with me. Um, and I really tried to encourage it, but, um, you know, especially when I was thinking about a million things and it was tired or whatever, and I was trying to come up with an answer that a lot of times I didn't have, you know, it was nice for somebody to say like, Hey, you know, like I appreciate it, but I need to be really direct with you about this. And I think, you know, our generation, certainly the generation before us, um, you know, they really, there's a, still a societal norm regarding respect in medical profession and it, you know, not saying it shouldn't be there, but, you know, you can ask for what you need directly and respectfully. Agreed. Do you think it's possible? Well, let me back up a step. So as a clinician, you basically had to keep telling people every day, all day, over and over and over. There's not very much I can do. Would it be beneficial if somehow we could wave a magic wand and provide primary care doctors and neurologists and neuropsychologists like a system of, okay, your loved one is at this stage and I'm just now meeting you and they're mid stage or whatever. Here's like the framework of a system that needs to be put in place to, to manage this disease going forward. Does that make sense? Not Absolutely. necessarily a medical system, but like a caregiving system, because many doctors don't have that tool. They hand you a pamphlet and they're like, hey, hey, good luck. That's yep. not very beneficial to anybody. And I'm sure it doesn't feel good to the doctor who has studied all these years to to help people to, you know, kind of smirk at them and go, hey, hey, I can't help you. That's not why they're yeah. doctors. You're sort of like, so I'd have the advantage of being like a real specialist niche in this area. Like it's all I do. So, you know, for me, you know, they, people would see like three or four different doctors before they would get to me. So by the mm -hmm. time that get to me, then I'd have like pr a pr fairly in comparison, a fairly robust set of like, okay, protocols and answers, et cetera, to the degree that I could give them. But for primary cares, neuro even neurologists, even geriatricians, psychiatrists, psychologists, all those professions, um, yeah, I mean, I've talked to a lot of those folks and they feel terrible about not being able to provide um, answers because that's, that's not just what they do professionally, but who they are personally, too. Makes sense. So it's, it's a very disheartening feeling. And I think you know, that's honestly, you nailed it because that's what I've been trying to do with my career for the last, you know, 10 years, 12 years is to get those protocols into the hands of the people that need them because, bef because they see all these other people before they even get to me. And they usually, people usually don't get to me. I'm usually fourth in line and they usually don't get there. So they get disenchanted and frustrated. So that's exactly what I would, you know, I was talking about at the beginning and we were talking about is that is the real disconnect is like, the people like me, there's so few of us, but we haven't gotten the information out to the front lines. So what I've been doing with our company is that, you know, my main thrust has been getting that information that larger hospital systems and getting that out to the front lines, to the caregivers, to the people, to the people that need it. So they have protocols and how to, how to go forward. And, um, they know what a neuropsychologist is. They know what a geriatric neuropsychologist is. Most people don't know that. So, um, I think that's like the big, one of the biggest issues that you just nailed. Well, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm smart enough to figure out a, a potential solution. So tell us about your company and your documentary because we haven't even touched on all that. And we've been chatting for almost an hour. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, in, it's the documentary in the book is called, this is dementia. It's a, it's a movie about, um, or, you know, documentary about kind of the early stages of the founding of my company, 
uh, my gr- you know, my grandmother had died a couple of years prior. So this is really between the years of 2015, early 2015 and 2017. And then sort of the company as it started, uh, you know, just a couple of different parallel themes, like, you know, my grandmother, the, the impact that she had, my, what I feel is my spiritual mission in helping people and caregivers, you know, dealing and identifying with dementia. Um, and then, you know, starting a business sort of reluctantly and then getting into the business side of things, which kind of led me, you know, to intertwine, I guess, my passion for helping people with, you know, something that I wasn't super passionate about, which is raising money for, you know, large amounts of money for company expansion. And then I kind of, you know, grew into that. We became a, a lot, you know, a lot larger company than, you know, I thought. And then um, just kind of like where, where it sort of all went from there. So, um, you know, it's, it, that's sort of the, the, the impetus. And then the company was really based upon finding Medicare reimbursable non-pharmaceutical approaches to helping mitigate dementia, you know, and, um, we basically, you know, we got a couple of patents on things, but one of the main things we did was make cognitive intervention, a Medicare reimbursable thing for people with, um, early stage dementia and prior to that Medicare would not reimburse for it. So, um, that took us a number of years and a bunch of research, but, um, you know, we're still as much as we've expanded, it's, it's still very much not even a drop in an ocean. Um, so we're really relying on, um, you know, you know, people like you and like the average person that's out there that just wants to spread the message. Right. Yep. So, you know, for me, it's like, I feel, honestly, I feel disheartened, uh, a lot of the time, but then I think to myself, like, look how much we were able to do with smoking in the last 15, 20 years. Look how much we were able to do with safe sex practices in the last 15 to 20 years. Look, you know, what, what we were able to do with COVID, um, which was pretty remarkable in certain respects. Um, and so I know that, I guess I try to give like the world a pep talk, but I know that we have <laughs> it, right? Like we definitely have it in us. Um, it's just, are we going to treat this with the same amount of urgency that we've treated things like cancer. And I, you know, I think when we light that fire, then I think hopefully, well, I I feel pretty confident we're going to be able to tackle this thing, but um, we don't seem to have a sense of urgency right now. Yeah. I hope, I hope the urgency happens sooner rather than later, you know, for those of us that are planning on living another 45, 50 years. Yeah. It's like, we need to, we need to step it up folks. And what is the name of your company? Uh, it's well, it was called smart brain aging. It's now called dementia prevention systems, um, incorporated. And, uh, the documentary is, this is dementia. It's on Netflix. It's on YouTube. It's on, I don't know, other stuff. It's free, you know, check it out. And, uh, it's not good. It's not great. It's not a, you know, super entertaining thing. It's just, uh, you know, me and, you know, people just trying to have the conversations that we're having now. And, you know, I always try to underscore for people. Just like, you know, don't be dependent on medical systems. Don't, please don't watch this documentary and interpret it as this is, this guy's exceptional in any way. Um, I'm not, I'm truly not. I just feel like I have a sense of urgency like you do. And, um, you know, like it's, you know, I'm just, just one person trying to do something and I'm not, you know, any bigger or better or smarter or different than uh, you know, any of the people that are watching your show and, you know, we're all, I think that's been a difficult thing in the past. We've had this sort of hierarchy and like, I just truly think that doesn't exist anymore in the, in this area with the medical field and the, in the average caregiver, the average caregiver knows more. Yeah. I do see the orbits of the different pieces of my Alzheimer's part of my life. They're they're slowly coalescing towards each other. Again, please hurry up. <laughs> but in just in I've been doing this for four years. This is the year five. A lot has changed in just this short period of time. And as you mentioned, COVID, you know, unfortunately, the isolation and the depression and the uncertainty have given researchers a treasure trove of new information to sift through, which 
I mean, that's that's not a bad thing. The reason is bad, but at least now they have it's it's kind of to me, COVID kind of sped up some of that research and made more information available. So while COVID wasn't great or isn't great, depending on where you're sitting with it. You know, there there was at least a small silver lining in that we've learned other things. You know, we've learned about isolation. We've learned about not locking families out of care homes with our loved ones. And, you know, I, I do, I think the urgency is coming, but yeah, it's going to have to come from those of us caregivers who are going to be like, yeah, I like that idea. Let's, let's give the doctors, you know, a framework for helping the caregivers care for the person because there is no cure. There is no prevention and we need to prevent caregiver burnout and death and dying from caregiving. And that to me is a medical issue. So I don't know, maybe this conversation will spark an idea with somebody. I am always amazed at the caregivers who turn into authors, app developers, movie producers, you know, plays, podcasts. It, you know, it's like, they don't just say, well, that was awful. I'm done. And, and they go on their merry way. This a, a blows my mind how many people there are like myself, or I'm like a whole group of people, however you want to word that. So let's go caregivers. Let's, Let's, you know, I started this podcast because I, there was a need that I had that wasn't being fulfilled and I filled it. So let's, as caregivers, let's, let's start filling these needs and helping the medical profession help us instead of waiting the other way around. Yeah. Beautifully said, beautifully said that I think that's exactly, exactly right. And I, and I just want to say personally, as somebody that's been a, a caregiver, um, you know, how much I admire and applaud and respect that role. And, um, I mean, I really, truly think that caregivers will lead this revolution. <laughs> oh my, the little bit of French I remember. Viva la revolution. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that my is... brain is working well today. <laughs> Is there anything I will link the your documentary in the show notes on YouTube because I sure. don't think I can do that with Netflix. I sure. know I could do it with YouTube. Is there anything last tidbit of information you want to lead this uh, future revolutionaries with? Yeah, um, any. So this is going to be a weird, but I truly <laughs> do this on every show or every talk that I give. Um, I love interacting with people. It's my number one thing that I love doing. And if there's anything I can do for anybody, I'm super and more than happy to do it. And people can call me. Okay. Um, and it's my cell phone number. And it truly is my cell phone number. And I truly answer it. And I truly do respond. And I will tell you, as much as I say it, I, I don't get a lot of calls. So I'm not begging for calls, but you're totally not hassling me if you do. And the number is uh, 602 five one zero nine two one seven six zero two five one zero nine two one seven and i will get back to you okay well i'll link that in the show notes too i'm not sure if that's going to be a hot link or not like i said technology doesn't like me right now but yeah if you got a question or you want to have john help you you know light the fire under this revolution give him a call and you're in the uh, central time zone correct that is correct. Okay. I'm on the, I'm on the West coast so far, not too many fires yet. <laughs> Probably not going to last, but that'll be, uh, you know, that, that way people know at least not to maybe ring you up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm up at four. <laughs> oh, okay. Not me. <laughs> but, uh, but, any, but honestly don't, you know, like this is not a hassle. It's something I enjoy doing. And if I can, if I can help connect, I can't give clinical advice, but if I can help connect at any point, um, I'm certainly happy to do so. It brings joy to me too. So it's not a hassle at all. Well, that is a wonderful offer. This has been a really fascinating topic. I don't think we touched on what I thought we were going to touch on, but that is perfectly fine. I am a curious person and I love to learn new things and talk to fascinating people like yourself. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. And to all your listeners, have a safe and wonderful July 4th and, um, and take care. You too. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.